Yeah, Gary, uh, many years ago, I suppose I'm giving my age up a little bit here, Dean, but it's probably 30 years ago, um, Gary used to be with a, a group of people that, that I sort of was involved with a hell of a lot, and Gary would walk into a room and he would just capture everybody's imagination. It's whether you knew him or, or not. Yep. He was just one of those guys that uh, he loved life, and uh, considering you know many of us complain about uh, everything around us, um, he's a gentleman that really knows how to get on with it. Right, this is part one of the Gary Wilson story. The fabric of racing folklore is built on colourful characters and their stories. Men and women who capture the imagination of the public by overcoming adversity. One of the greatest examples is Greyhound Racing's Gary Wilson, who, after suffering debilitating injuries as a baby, rose to fame with his champion sprinter, Woolly Wilson. I became disabled when I was a at the age of six months old, when um, I, I choked on a dummy, a, a pacifier, and I must have inhaled it. And in those days, they didn't, they didn't have the exterior ring that goes all over your face like they do today. And I think they just had a little pin that used to just uh, uh, attach to your vest, and then that, that, that's what stopped you from swallowing it. But apparently, uh, they must have come off the uh, pin, and uh, I must have been crying at the time, or, or trying to cry. And I, inhaled the dummy and it just um, it, uh, got lodged in my throat and by the time they got me to the doctors I was uh, I was bleeding from my nose and my ears and uh, and the doc and the doc the doctor at the time tried to get it out and he put his finger down my throat and pushed it down further but uh, anyway the uh, so fate has it that that they finally cut it out with a, with a knife they cut the cut through my throat and got it. But by that, by then I was, I was dead by about two and a half minutes. And um, the doctor said to my mum and dad, if if Gary lives, he's going to be no more than a vegetable. So yeah, maybe it's best if you pray that he dies. So uh, they, they called mum and dad to come and say goodbye to me three times in a row, but I didn't die, yeah? What a waste of petrol, huh? <laughs> <laughs> It didn't take long before the racing bug had bit and Gary was swabbing the school books for form guides. I got a, got a good education and, um, uh, and I did quite well at school until the age of about 14 until um, I got addicted to greyhound racing and the form guides and then I used to bring the form guide along to school and, um, and uh, instead of doing my mathematics uh, session I'd be pulling out the form guy, working out 20 bucks at 6 to 4 and, and 40 bucks at 9 to 4. And, and, uh, and the teacher sprung me a few times and he said to me, Gary, it's either the form guide or the, the, um, the textbooks. And I said, well, you can shove the textbooks where the sun don't shine. That's why I said. <laughs> so I, I left school and uh, I've been studying form ever since. And... Um, I was, I was sitting on the sideline. I used to go to the rugby league every week because I was a Penrith Panther mascot. And uh, I was sitting on the sideline and, and, uh, and uh, with Jeff Prenter. And uh, I, I, he was backing, backing loser after loser at the races. And I said, look, I said, why don't you, why don't you give up racing, uh, tippy, uh, backing racehorses? And I said, I'll give you a few tips at the dogs. Well, you wouldn't give, believe it, I gave him three tips that night for three winners. And, and then he's on the phone the following Monday and say, look, Gary, I reckon you're a real good judge of dog. Would you be interested in being a guest tipster for the Sun newspaper? I said, geez, I said, I'll give up the football for that. I said, that's great. So, so he put me on the payroll and I got, I, got, I, got, I got a huge 10 bucks a week for doing the tips. But that didn't worry. I was as happy as a pig in mud. So I picked 60 winners. And that, was, that, that was an average of five, five winners a, a night. And, and they were really impressed with my, with my percentage. Gary had formed other close relationships in the media, and it was through his association with the late Frank Kennedy that Gary owned his first two greyhounds. I started racing a greyhound back in 1968 when I, when I bought my first two dogs. Uh, in actual fact, I got them for 50 bucks each. Uh, they were, and Frank Kennelly, which is uh, my dear friend from uh, 
70s, he, uh, he, he uh, conned, virtually conned the, uh, the owners of the uh, pups uh, from $400 down to $50 per pup. So I, I came away with a bargain. I came away with $800 worth of pups, but $100. And those pups turned out to be uh, just super dogs. One was called Pacermatic. He won 21 races plus four track records. And the other one was Top Streak. She won 29 races, and she won from 300 yards to 800 yards at Harold Park. So very versatile chases indeed. These first two ultimately led to Gary's champion, Willie Wilson the greyhound that was to change Gary's life. However, it almost didn't happen. Actually, the true story behind Wally Wilson is this, never been told before, is the fact that um, I bought Wally Wilson's sister Holiday Magic prior to buying Wally. And I brought her home and she, she kicked up such a blue, she yapped and she barked and cried all night. My old man says, Gary, he said, either take that one back or go and buy a partner for it. And I said, well, Dad, I was going to buy another one as well but to go with it, but I haven't got the money. And so Dad said, well, here's another 300 bucks. Go, go and buy the other one. So I went back to Alan Chauncey's place, and uh, uh, luckily the one that I chose to go with Holiday Magic wasn't gone, which was Wooly Wilson. I chose him because he had a, he had a very thick woolly coat. And, I, and he had such a gentle nature, even though he was only six weeks old. I thought, this is the one for me. So um, I, I brought Willie Wilson home the next day and they, we read them both in the backyard and the rest is history. One of the highlights of Gary's life came away from the racetrack. It was a tribute paid by his family and friends. Gary Wilson, this is your life. Shortly after Willie Wilson's success, um, um, uh, I was surprised with being put on that show called This Is Your Life. That was, that was poss possibly one of the highlights, or the highlight of my whole um, career. Uh, I couldn't believe it when, uh, when they, actually, they actually surprised me. Um, Ray Warren rang me up and said, hey Gunner, he says, can you get yourself down here? He says that uh, we want to do a documentary on past Greyhound champions. And he says, um, he said that, that Willie Wilson is one of those. So he says, yeah, can you just get yourself down? So I, I said to my, my, I said, yeah, okay, Ray, I'll be down there. Uh, I'll get Dad to bring me down. So I said, I got off the phone and said, hey, Dad. I said, uh, uh, can you take me down to um, um, Wentworth Park next Friday? I said, I've got, I've got an interview to do with Ray Warren. His dad said, listen, Gary, he said, you've big noted yourself. And he said, you made all the plans. He said, you can get yourself down there. I thought, Jesus. I said, well, well, well that's a pretty miserable attitude. But I didn't, I didn't know that while, while I was catching the bus down from Cessnock to Sydney, my mum and dad and all the family were, here, were getting their suits on and getting their hair done and, and get, getting trimmed up for this is your life. So I, all the way down, I kept saying to the bus driver, the miserable bastard, I can't understand why you, I had to catch a bus down instead of him taking me down. So um, as it turns out now, it was all for a reason. And, um, and the, this is your life, uh, the, this is your life surprise was so, so much of a shock to me. I actually fell over during the first take of the surprise and the cameraman had to do the take over again. He said to me, do you think you can do it again? He said, he said because you've fallen over halfway through with, with shock. I said, well, look, if you, if you do it again right now, I'm still surprised. I'm certain. I said, no one will even know. The appearance on This Is Your Life produced a hidden talent. My father taught me how to play the harmonica when I was only a youngster. I used to sit on, sit on the tack on the uh, veranda at home and wait for the taxi to pick me up from school. And, uh, and so I used to play the harmonica every morning just for something to do, you know, and keep the cats away. And, and, uh, and uh, my, I, I played the harmonica uh, on This Is Your Life show, and I also had um, much enjoyment playing the harmonica with my dear friend Johnny Tapp. Uh, Johnny Tapp used to um, um, 
invite invite me to a uh, sporting nights at uh, Auburn RSL and Canterbury Leeds Club and the Grafton RSL, you know, when they had the Calcutta up there every year. And uh, Johnny Tapp would play the guitar or play the piano and, uh, and I would play the harmonica and we'd just have a great time. I want key, but you've only got one key, gee. <laughs> It wasn't long before Gary's association with another of Australia's most colourful characters led to a regular spot on national television. Yeah, John Singleton is, a, is, a, is one in a million as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, but after the This Is Your Life show went to air, it was shortly after, um, uh, he rang me up and said, you know, Gary, um, yeah, we'd, like to, we'd like you to come on my, my Tonight Show and uh, just uh, come on and play the harmonica and spin a yarn and, and uh, just see how you go. So, um, so I went on there the first time and I deliberately didn't bring my harmonica. So, so I'd have the excuse to come back again. And, you, and, and thankfully that worked because I told a couple of yarns and me and John get on very well. And um, John invited me back and he said to me, Gary, he says, how would you like it? He said, if I got you on the show on a weekly segment, I said, I'd love it. He said, we'll even pay you. He said, nobody else on the show gets paid, but we'll pay you. So he, so he paid me a couple of hundred dollars a week, which is beautiful. And, um, and I used to get on the show, and we used to do a segment called Flogger Dog with Mario McCaskill. And we used to do another segment called Animal New Faces, where people would bring in their cockatoos and monkeys and dogs and horses and you name it. And they'd do tricks, and, uh, and I'd be one of the judges. And I'd be like a... Jose Feliciano goes, because I can't see. <laughs> so, but, but people you know, enjoyed it, and that's what the name of the game is about, enjoying yourself. Gary Wilson, this is your life. By the late 1970s, Gary Wilson's popularity away from the racetrack was at its peak. However, Gary would rarely miss a meeting, often being chauffeured to the track by the race callers. One of the drivers was the voice of Greyhound Racing, Paul Ambrosoli. Uh, I used to go with Paul to the Doggers every Thursday and Wednesday to Bulleye and that though, and, uh, and on the way home it was my job to wake him, to wake him up at every set of lights that, that uh, that were that turned green, like you pull up at the stoplights, and um, they'd be red, and all of a sudden you'd see the eyes close like this. I say, all of a sudden they turn green, and I say, hey Paul, Paul, what? The lights are turned green. Oh, oh, thanks, Gary. And we say, so, so, oh, and then I say, oh no. So I, it was my, I, I, I felt as if I had to keep talking, non-stop, and telling him yarns and jokes and making him answer me just to keep him awake, because I thought, oh, I'm not going to make it home. Of course, Gary's also a very good storyteller. He likes to embellish them occasionally. He loves telling the story about the day he asked me if he could have a hot bath. And after I'd put him in the bath, the farrier came to my house, so momentarily I left Gary. The moment actually went for about two hours because I forgot all about him. And when I came back, I've got to tell you, he really was hot stuff. He was like a little red lobster in the bathtub. And he loves telling the story. Of course, I only remember it being about an hour that I left him in the bathtub, but Gary likes to tell people it was more like five or six. I can remember vividly, uh, he, he, I went to his place for a week. He put me in the bath on a Sunday morning. He said, uh, I'll put you in the bath. And uh, so I was in the bath, and all of a sudden the front door bell rang. And it was, uh, it was the... Um, the man came to shoe his horses, and he, and he must have forgotten all about me being in the bath, and uh, and I was I was forced to stay in the bath for two and a half hours. And when he come when he come to rescue me from the tub, I was, I was like a I was like a shriveled up prune, not not to mention uh, not to mention frozen because the water was cold. <laughs> I've had a wonderful association with people like Graham McNeese, uh, Ray Conroy, Paul Ambrosoli, Johnny Tapp, Ian Craig. Yeah, they, they, they were so good to me throughout the years and, and um, they, all, they all offered their, their hand in support and help throughout those years. Uh, I can remember, like a, I think it would be about 1973 or 4, um, um, 
Uh, oh, Graham Whitney used to um, carry me up here, up to the broadcast box, and uh, and he'd have.